I'm James Zimmerman. We're coming to you today from the Skirmerhorn Symphony Center, home of the Nashville Symphony. We've got a big week for clarinet this week with the Shostakovich Violin Concerto and Mendelssohn's Third Symphony. And since the Mendelssohn has such a big clarinet part, I thought we'd take a closer look at what goes on there. So come on in and we'll check it out. Hey, so we're backstage at the Skirmerhorn now. The first thing that I do when I start to prepare for a concert is pick up my music. I pick it up out of these big drawers each one of the drawers has the name of the concert on it, in this case, Classical 5. So after I pick up the music, I head to my station back here. So when I first picked up the music for this Mendelssohn concert, I realized that this is an edition that I've never seen before. And in this edition, the first note of the solo in the second movement is slurred into the second note. So in the immortal words of Mr. Horse... No, sir, I don't like it. To be honest, I hate it. First of all, it's not what I'm used to. The version I grew up playing is the one that's on IMSLP, with the first note detached from the rest of the excerpt. The second reason I hate it is because I think it sounds better the old way. It's more cheerful, it's got a little bit more pep to it. But since this new edition is out, as of 2006, and this is the one that my orchestra has given me, I think we better get to the bottom of it. So let's go talk to the library. So I'm here in the Nashville Symphony Library with principal librarian Jennifer Goldberg. We've got all the editions that exist in this library here in front of us. The new or text version, and then this old school one that I grew up with. So Jennifer, when an editor makes a big change like this, why do they do that? They are usually referring back to original source material that they have found through their research and they believe is a more accurate version of the performance. That's what it says in here. The editor wishes to extend his thanks first to all the libraries as well as their staffs which allowed us a comprehensive examination of the sources in their possession which preserves the autograph score. So we're going to assume that this is what Mendelssohn wrote, right? The slur? That is the assumption. Well, I guess that answers that question, doesn't it? It probably makes sense to trust the people whose job it is to research the old manuscripts and look through all the old editions to put together the best possible authentic manuscript for us to play off of. So even though this means dropping some traditions that I've held dear to for my whole career, that's my job, is to try to be authentic, to try to serve the music, to try to serve the composer. The flute and the oboe have the same thing in their music with the pickup slurred into the next part of the figure. I'm not gonna put up a fight about it in rehearsal, I'll just play what's on the page and we'll see what happens. What do you all think? Are you in favor of this change or do you like it the old way? I'm gonna put up a poll here and we can all vote and see what the consensus is. Might be interesting to find that out. So I think I'm as prepared as I can be. The first rehearsal's tomorrow, so. I'll check you then. Hey, so we're here getting ready for the first rehearsal. And my goal today is to get the quietest possible beginning to the second movement of Mendelssohn that I can. If there's a balance problem, like if I'm getting covered up by the strings in the beginning, there's two basic things that the conductor can do. He could ask me to play more, or he could ask the string section to play less. My goal is to compel everybody around me to play quietly. That involves doing a really good job with this opening solo, so people will say, hey, I really want to listen to that. I want to make sure I don't cover that up. Let's get nice and quiet. I take it upon myself to try to be inspiring, to try to convince everybody, hey, this will sound great if we play quietly. So we'll see how it goes. So I thought that was not bad for a first run through. I'm back at my house now, I'm reviewing the recordings from today's rehearsal. Balance was great, I felt comfortable there. Most of what we focused on during today's rehearsal though was timing. Our music director Giancarlo Guerrero is a percussionist, so timing and rhythm are very important to him. Listen to what he had to say right after the first run through. It's one of those moments that you have to find the right groove. If it goes just one inch too fast, it fails. If it goes one inch too slow, it fails. But we will find it. I mean, we're very close to it. And the thing is to make sure that it feels settled and it feels Scottish heavy enough. After we ran through the movement, we went back and started again. Listen to this. You'll hear that Giancarlo and I are not exactly on the same page as far as tempo. Yeah, we're getting 
fast. You can, you can eat fast out, out of the 16. Ta -ta -ra 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 -ta -ta. It gets fast. Clearly, I'm getting a little ahead of the rest of the orchestra, so we tried it again. So that time, the first eight bars were a little shaky, but the next eight bars were fine. That's exactly what Giancarlo said. Listen to his comment. Yeah, the first time was a little fast, but then, then you settled. You, what happened is I hear, you just get too fast on, the, on, the, on, on the, the march rhythm. I'm just not comfortable with this tempo. I feel like it's too slow. I started to feel like Kramer from that episode of Seinfeld where his quilt is stuck at the cleaners. You ever seen that one? My quilt is still at the cleaners. Jerry, I can't sleep without my quilt. Like the other night, I was cold. So last night, I turn up the heat, it's too hot. I open up a window, it's too cold. I can't get into the zone. I just couldn't get into the zone. I wanted to go faster, but Giancarlo didn't. And as we tried it over and over, it wasn't improving. So I decided to voice my opinion. Too fast. Yeah. Huh? The tempo feels heavy to me. Yeah. Can we try to go a little bit? Well, faster? if I go just a little too fast, I'm gonna play later with, the, with your colleagues in the horn. I know that if I just go too fast, da -da 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 -da, it, it becomes impossible. I mean, I can only go so fast without having to pay the price later and having to slow down. So Giancarlo thinks that if we go any faster, the third and fourth horn are going to struggle to keep up with the tempo and we're going to have to slow down later anyway. Which makes sense, I can see that. As we kept rehearsing it, the same thing kept happening. The first eight bars were shaky and the second eight bars were fine. So Giancarlo made the same comment again. You know what the key is, James? The key is that it's the first time, for whatever reason, it's faster, but then the second time you come in, it's perfect. So maybe it's that, that in your mind, you have this tempo just a little bit on the faster side. He could very well be right about that. I might have a different tempo in my mind for this piece than he does. I grew up listening to this recording of the Berlin Philharmonic with James Levine conducting. I love this recording. I love the way it sounds. And I'm curious what tempo they're going. So we'll check into that in a minute. I want to keep listening to this rehearsal for now. I was starting to get a little frustrated at this point, but Giancarlo was still being very positive. Listen to this. I know we can solve it. It's the first time that it's, it's giving us trouble. The second presentation is not a problem at all. It's just the very first one. Would you mind if you do it just one more time? That'd be great. Thank you. Let's get it together. Let's get it right. So that's the third time he said that. First presentation's no good. Second presentation's fine. The next time we tried it, I decided to do something a little different. Rather than watch Giancarlo, I decided to look straight at Juni Wasaki, our concertmaster. Watch my eyes during this next clip. So that was the best one yet. And I started to think of this other Seinfeld episode. I, tell you, I never really understood the importance of the conductor. I mean, between you and me, what the hell is this guy doing? <laughs> I mean, do you really need somebody waving a stick in your face to play the violin? Does that really help you out? I'm just kidding. Sorry, that was a cheap shot. I know conductors are very important. I can see how we need him at the beginning, okay? Tap, tap, tap. Start, okay? I can see how you need that. But once we're going, okay? Once it's all happening, what, what do we need him for then? All right, I'm done. I promise. So going back to what Giancarlo said about my tempo possibly being faster than his, I want to compare that Berlin Philharmonic recording to our rehearsal from today and see if we can find anything out. So this program is called Logic. It's really easy to put a recording on a click track in this program. 
The first thing I did was put the Berlin fill recording in here, and I discovered that their tempo was exactly quarter note equals 129. I love that. Super clean, super tidy. The next thing I did was listen to this morning's rehearsal, and I discovered that Giancarlo's starting tempo was 126, just like it says in the score. You'll hear that in his count off. But listen to what happens. The orchestra gets a little bit ahead of him. So by the time I have to come in, it's kind of a mess. So I attempted to just lay it down, and I discovered, when I listened to the recording, I was going pretty much the same tempo as the Berlin Philharmonic, 129. Listen to this. Even though the orchestra's not together, you'll hear that I'm pretty much consistent at my tempo. So I think I've figured out what kept happening. The strings would start with Giancarlo's tempo, and then they'd drift a little ahead, and by the time the brass came in, we're a little faster than we started. The problem for me was, I can't hear the strings when the brass are playing, so I tend to follow whatever the brass had just done, and then when the brass drop out, the strings are at a different tempo than I'm playing, and it takes eight measures to settle. So what I'm going to do tomorrow is ask Giancarlo before rehearsal if he can make sure that the brass entrance is exactly in time with the strings, and that way I'll be able to start comfortably. I'm also going to talk to June, our concertmaster, about his ideal tempo for this piece, and I'm going to talk to our third and fourth horns too about their ideal tempo for this piece to see if that's informative. By the way, I can't stress enough the value of listening to recordings of yourself. If you're already in an orchestra, listen to recordings of your concerts. If you're not in an orchestra, record yourself practicing these solos. It will tell you everything you need to know about what to fix. At this point, I think I know what needs to happen. I need to make sure I'm staying consistent in my tempo throughout the solo, and I need a little help from Giancarlo in making sure that the tempo is consistent for the first eight bars of the piece before I come in. That's it for today. I'll see you tomorrow. All right, so we're on this little fact-finding mission here to try to figure out if there's an ideal tempo for any other instruments besides me. Between 126 and 132 area is, is a good tempo for 16th notes for the bow to bounce. Play what you think is comfortable and I'm gonna tap along with okay. you and we'll, we'll, just, we'll take it from there. Just the opening? Yeah. That feels that was approximately where you like it. You know, just try that. I'm not telling you what it is. Okay. So that's 132. So that I think what that is is my go-to for Mozart 39 last movement. Let's try one more. Yeah. was like 128, 129. Yeah. So Giancarlo is sticking to the ink, mm -hmm. 126. Your preference, 132. If I was playing it by myself and I didn't see the metronome marking and I didn't seek out a metronome and just started playing it at a comfortable tempo that I thought was a vivace, it would be around there, I think. Now, I'm no math genius, but what is exactly between Giancarlo's tempo of 126 and your tempo of 132? Is it 129? Hmm. Try this at 126, yeah. just for fun. You want to go faster? Yeah, I do. I'm not even out to prove a point here. I'm just saying. What is, where does it work? Your initial question was what is the most natural tempo for this kind of bow stroke? And yeah. for me it's faster than 126, it is. I think that's why in my head and in my muscles I, I picked 130, 132. It's physical, right? It just kind of... 
instead of da, 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 da. you don't want to feel like it's you're holding back something. I feel like at 126, I'm having to control my bow and not just let it go. Awesome. Thanks. There you go. So now I'm here with Patrick and Hunter, who are the third and fourth horns of the orchestra. Hunter was saying yesterday that when he prepares his piece for auditions, he looks for recordings, and generally they're in the 130s, you said? 130, 132, quarter note equals, yeah. How's that feel on the horn? It's doable. Um, I think there's a, it, it's written 126 for a reason, and it, that, that groove feels pretty much correct where it should be. Um, but uh, it's, I think a lot of us lean towards the faster side because of what we hear on those recordings, though. So. You were saying the same thing when you prepare this for auditions. Even under 126 is preferable, right? Yeah, if I'm starting it in a first round or whatever, I'll, I'll play it a little like more like 122 because I can get better clarity. And if the committee is going to ask me to play it a little bit faster, I have room to get it up to that 126. I pretty much max out at 126. So in an audition situation, it's okay to go a little bit slower for clarity, you think? Absolutely. Yeah, I do the definitely. same thing. I mean, there's nobody else playing with you, so clarity is a huge part of auditions. But this isn't an audition, we're in the orchestra. Yeah. And the maestro is really dead set on 126, so that's pushing the upper limit. Yeah of what you guys are comfortable with. I think it's important, you know, obviously when you're playing for the rest of the orchestra not to slow down as we all start playing and not become too heavy like we were talking about yesterday. Mm. On recordings I've heard, that's generally what happens. When the whole orchestra comes in, it clicks down a notch or two. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you start at 126 and then it clicks down, then you're then getting into a dangerous better. tempo. Yeah. Especially for the string players, their stroke yeah. is suspect yeah. in the low 120s. I think. Anything else? No, that's great. Great? Yeah. Cool. Interestingly, in the hallway I ran into our assistant conductor, Enrico Lopez Yanez, and he had some input about the slur issue. This is the Baron Rider score. In this edition, it does in fact have a slur for the clarinet pickup note. So that, the most current edition, it's slurred. It's slurred. And but then when that the old other, one, it's detached. Uh, no, it's detached in all parts except the clarinet at the beginning. So even when we get to letter A and the flute and oboe have that figure, they too have it detached. No way. Whereas the clarinet at the beginning has it slurred. So the most current Baron Rider version is slurred at the beginning. That's right. And he still cannot play it. <laughs> wow, shots fired. How about that? I deserve that. I definitely had that coming. I deserve that. Okay, I think I've gathered all the information I can from my colleagues. We're about to go have the Mendelssohn rehearsal now, so I'm gonna pack up the camera and we'll check back in tomorrow. Hey, good morning, I just woke up and check out all this fog. This is the foggiest day I've seen in Nashville for months. Somebody knows we're playing the Scottish Symphony today. Anyway, I just thought that was funny. I gotta go eat breakfast and head over to dress rehearsal. Hey, so we're here in the boss's office at the Skirmerhorn. Giancarlo has invited me into the special couch where, what did you just say, you take naps on this? Long naps after long rehearsals of Mendelssohn. Yeah, so it wasn't that long today. We didn't really need to do anything. It was great. The orchestra never ceases to amaze me, the preparation. A piece that is so incredibly virtuosic, but you guys always hit it out of the park. So the first day we were struggling. I was struggling because your tempo was slower than the one I had in my mind. What do you mm -hmm. like to do for this one? Uh, for me, the second movement of the Mendelssohn has way too many constituencies. That's the problem. If you just go too fast, it might work for you, but it might not work for half the other orchestra or vice versa. So you have to find a tempo that in the end it will be stable, but it will be working for everybody. When you started mentioning in the rehearsal that it felt slow, I could see right behind you, the third and fourth horn, your colleague just gave me this look of, Please don't, don't go with that because you're gonna kill us in about five minutes when we have a big solo. So a lot of this takes negotiations about what is best for the music and by the second day I thought everything just came together perfectly. Yeah, I feel like we trust each other, mm -hmm. you and me, like mm -hmm. we've been doing this, this is our 10th year together. Yeah, and you so were I, my first hire, remember. That's right, that's yeah. right. You have great taste in clarinet. I <laughs> so I feel like I can say in the rehearsal, hey, this is a little fast yeah. and I'm not gonna make you angry. Oh, not never. Because I mean, we're on the same team. But what you're always trying to achieve, and that's something unique I would say to the Nashville Symphony, and that's what makes me very proud of our orchestra. The fact that our, the players in the orchestra feel empowered to just give their opinions what is best in the music. It's not against me or against, no, it's we want to do our best. And listen, as a conductor, I always feel that my job is to 
create the necessary environment so you guys can give 100%. And by stepping out of the way many times and letting you do your magic and having that trust that I know that it's going to be fine, listen, it makes our jobs easier and the music, I think, gains by it. Yeah. Did you just perform this piece last week in another orchestra? Yes, I've done it. This year I've done it four times. Uh, and this was the first time I've ever done the piece. So when you say something like, I know that the horns might struggle coming up, I know that this tempo doesn't work for the violins, that's based on past experience. Not only that, and it's based on auditions too. Remember that, that horn passage, uh, the famous third and fourth horn passage in the second movement, that's audition material. Yeah. Any, any, anybody who wants to get into any orchestra, I promise you, it will come up. And there is one tempo I've come to find that it works. I always err on the side of being cautious, because again, the adrenaline at the concert always kicks in. Yeah. And even when you think you're in control, no, there's a little nerves, the audience is there, you will kick it a little bit more. So, so if you pick a tempo that's too fast and then you got adrenaline, yeah. then you're gonna have a mess. Oh, you're gonna pay for it. But remember when you're doing something for the first time, you're kind of testing the waters. Yeah. You know, you kind of go in and you put your toe in and nothing that you prepared at home or practice really prepares you for the real thing. And I don't care what's faster or softer, as long as it works for the music in our hall and with our players, you know, that's what you want. You want an honest presentation. It's not the ultimate. No, it is our presentation and we are happy with it. And five years, three years from now, we do it again. I promise you, it's going to be different. And it should be. I think that's it. Thank you so much for this. Always a pleasure, man. I appreciate Come it. Come on, man. Always a pleasure. Anytime. Hey, the concerts are done. Feels like they went great. We had a lot of fun. There's just one more thing I want to do. I want to see where the tempo landed. So I'm going to get the audio files from our sound engineer and then we'll take a look at that. So here are the recordings of our two concerts. This blue one is Friday and the green one is Saturday. On top is the tempo track, which shows how our tempo fluctuated. Overall, our tempo was just under 126, so Giancarlo got what he was looking for. You can see that on Friday, there were some more radical shifts than there were on Saturday. And you can also see that while it was more steady on Saturday, it was generally a bit slower. I'm going to play Friday night because I think it's a more exciting performance overall. It was a little rougher here in the second excerpt that's often asked in auditions, probably because of these dramatic shifts that happened right beforehand. You can see those didn't really happen on Saturday. Maybe it's because we were more comfortable in the second performance. That happens sometimes. The biggest surprise to me was that in both performances, the tempo kicked up a notch when the horns entered, which is exactly the opposite of what Giancarlo was anticipating. One click up on Friday night, two clicks up on Saturday. I'm going to play the Friday recording now. I'll start it with the metronome on, then I'll turn it off after the first eight bars. You can still watch the tempo up here. I'll also put the music on the screen so you can follow along. So there you have it. We ended up just under 126. My preference would have been to go a little bit faster, but when you're in an orchestra, you have to be flexible. I thought it was a good performance. Personally, I left some room for improvement. There were a couple intonation things I didn't love, and my rhythm could have been even tighter, but I think I had good character and sound. 
I'm really proud of the orchestra. I think we came a long way throughout the week and we gave two really good concerts. The Shostakovich Violin Concerto was great too. Believe me, I could have made a video just about that clarinet part. So what do we learn from this? First of all, regarding the slur. You've got the original manuscript, which is slurred. You've got the Hampton edition on IMSLP, which is detached. You've got the Breitkopf and Hartel version that we played from 2006, which is slurred. And the Berenreiter version from 2011, which is slurred. So the slur seems to win out. If you're going to play this in an orchestra, my recommendation would be to play whatever's put in front of you. But if you're getting ready for an audition, my recommendation would be to contact the orchestra and find out which edition the committee's going to be looking at. You wouldn't be out of line at all by asking this question. You'd be being thorough. Secondly, regarding tempo, I think 126 works really well. Mark Nuccio told me years ago that when he was preparing to audition for the New York Philharmonic, he bought every recording he could find of Kurt Mazur conducting the audition repertoire, not just with the New York Phil, but other orchestras too, and he played those tempos in the audition. That kind of sounds like overkill to me, but hey, he did win the job, so what do I know? Besides, you could do this for free now with Spotify and YouTube, so you might as well if you want to be really thorough. Thirdly, we learn the value of recording ourselves. Sometimes what we think is going on is not really what's going on. The last thing I expected to discover on that recording of the concert was that the horns were speeding up when they came in. But hey, recordings don't lie, so check them out. Finally, regarding your relationship with your conductor, remember, he or she is there to help you. There is no shame in asking for help, either publicly or privately, especially when it's done respectfully and in the spirit of making the music sound better. In my experience, you have nothing to lose by doing this. They'll appreciate the fact that you went in for help. If you want to play at the highest level, you need all the help you can get. I think that's it. I'm eager to hear your feedback, so please comment here or on Facebook or get in touch with me at clarinetjobs at gmail.com and let me know your thoughts. This was my first time making a video like this, and I hope to improve the videos in the future, so your feedback would be much appreciated. So until next time, happy practicing and good luck.